Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome. It's been a while. Um, Tiffany Edwards, your current chair for the ETAC, Envision Eugene Technical Advisory Committee. And it is October 6th, 2022. And I just want to welcome everybody. Um, we are meeting by Zoom. So for, for folks who have are not familiar at this point with Zoom and how it all works, um, it, we, we like to have folks keep their cameras on and keep yourself muted unless you're speaking. And of course, the raise your hand feature, um, or I can see everybody. So this works as well. So, um, and I'll try to be, be mindful of that. Um, we have a, an agenda that's out and I do not recall whether or not we need an approval of the agenda. Usually we just, if anybody has anything to add, right? Okay. So we don't need like a motion. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about the, uh, we're, get, we're getting an urban reserves update and uh, growth monitoring timeline overview, some other things. Um, no real action today, but discussion and uh, presentation from staff. So if um, we could move to the next item, which is the approval of the Zoom meeting summary. And I don't know if everybody's had a chance to review that, but if there's any comments or changes, um, I don't know if you could make the changes to the Zoom, but be happy to entertain a motion for approval of that. This Kevin, I'll move that we approve the minutes or the notes. Second. Okay, moved by Kevin, seconded by Sue. Sue, did you have your hand up for a different reason or was that? No, only, only to approve. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any discussion? All right, with that, I will call for the vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes from uh, August 18th, raise your hand. All right, and uh, any opposed or any abstaining? Okay, Lisa, abstaining? Wonderful, so that motion passes. Um, at this time, we also are going to ask if there is any members of the public who would like to speak. And I guess I will look to Elena to see, is there anybody participating? We do have a member of the public here. Um, okay. I heard from them earlier. I think they're a U of O journalism student. Um, but I can, I don't know if they're interested in, in speaking. Well, how about we do this? If um, if there are any members of the public who would like to speak, you may go ahead and raise your virtual hand. Um, I believe you can do that, and I don't see any hand raising. So no hand I'm going to assume he just he just wants to um, see what we're up to tonight. So so with that, I will kind of go and continue to keep moving us right along, and hopefully we can be. Um, efficient with our time tonight. So um, we'll move right into the second agenda item, which is our urban reserves update. And Rebecca is going to take us through that. So welcome. Thank you. It's exciting to be back um, and good to see all of your faces. Um, Dennis, I am Rebecca Gershow. I'm a senior planner with community planning and design, I called you out because I think that you're the only new ETAC member since um, I was last an ETAC regular staffer, which was almost two years ago now. Um, so the last time we were here, we might have given an update after getting direction from the board and city council on our proposed urban reserves. Um, since then, we have been working on our adoption package and, um, and we are now actively in our adoption phase. And so I want to um, update you guys on where we are. I sent links to all the materials. I don't expect you to have gone through it. I don't really know what level of detail to get into tonight. Um, 
it's really up to you. I'm going to start quite high level and sort of let you lead the discussion. Um, it can be as informal as you like. Um, I put an outline together. We just went to the County Planning Commission um, two nights ago. And so I'm going to use some of those same slides. But um, so I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to like jump to the middle of my presentation that I did for them. And Heather, how much time do we have? Like 45 minutes? Okay. So. I'll probably talk for like 15 minutes and then um, ask any questions that you like. And we're a little ahead of schedule, so. Okay, so we have plenty of time. And um, before I do that, I just want to give a big shout out to Thea and to Zoli, who have put in a tremendous amount of work on urban reserves. When when we were working with you and over the last two years. Heather also was able to find time to help refine our work um, after, after some of her growth management workload lightened up. So just a big shout out to, um, to our team, who uh, a definite group effort. Okay, so I'm going to share. Here we go. Okay, so can you see, do you see the screen that has my slide sort of up? It's yes. in, it's in like present, it's not in it's presentation. In, it's mode. not in presentation mode, right? Cause I'm gonna skip forward. <laughs> Got it. Cause I'm, cause I'm gonna show you what I'm not gonna show you. And then you know what you can ask me about coming back to, but don't we like this picture of Howard right here? So this is from my um, from our county presentation. And a you, cute puppy. What is that? That's a cute puppy because that uh -huh. puppy is part of Eugene Springfield Fire. Oh. Um, and they were one of our service providers. So we got a puppy at one of our meetings. Yay. Um, okay. So, so I gave them the whole background on urban reserves that I can come back to for Dennis or for anyone else, but I want to, um, spend most of my time talking about the adoption package. Um, so we walk them through the differences of um, what it would be like um, expanding the UGB potentially without urban reserves. And then with urban reserves, we talked about different boundaries. And this is a, um, a property owner matrix that you can't read at all, but all of these things are on our website. So we went through the different pieces of the work of urban reserves, of which technical analysis was the beginning and what you uh, were completely enmeshed in. I counted and we had met with the ETAC 18 times when we were doing our technical analysis and our suitability analysis work. Um, this was our study area and our de uh, developable land analysis. We moved into our suitability analysis. We split our sub area into 18, our study area into 18 different sub areas. Um, and we identified suitable land. Um, we had some open houses back in the day when we had big public meetings. Um, we had three different open houses, and some of you participated in those. And then we moved into our option development phase. And I'm going to sort of pick up there because um, this is where we got into the details of the proposal. This is sort of like where we left off with you. Um, when we uh, developed several urban reserve options um, and refined them, um, and then receive direction from our decision makers. And then um, how we got to our proposal, just as a refresher, was that we selected from our suitable land, 
um, in, in this very specific order um, based on state guidance, um, where we first looked at rural, residential, commercial, or industrial lands called exception areas. And then we were able to select these orange color marginal lands. And then if we still needed land to meet our projected needs, we were able to select from our third priority, which was agricultural and forestry lands. And then this is an old map, but it's a um, refresher on how we characterized our agricultural and our forest soils, how we developed a land classification system in order to prioritize them within that third priority system, where you can see these yellow lands are the highest classification agricultural soils. So in November of 2020, we got our direction, which the ETAC, um, sort of started the ball rolling. The ETAC recommended um, this 27 year option. Our planning commission as well recommended it. And the city council unanimously directed us. And then the board of commissioners on November 10th agreed with council's recommendation to proceed with the 27 year urban reserve option. So um, that yellow land that you saw in our soil classification map, you will notice is, as a reminder, is not included in our urban reserves. So this direction, was in support of the urban reserves that didn't include the study areas, highest value farmland, or those additional properties with higher value soils adjacent to it. Um, both the council and the board expressed an interest in preserving the highest value agricultural land from future urbanization. This proposed urban reserve includes just over 5,900 developable acres, which are expected to provide 27 year supply of developable land from 2032 to 2059, which is our planning period. I don't need to talk about public engagement. Um, so, since that point, we have been um, in the adoption phase. So we've been refining and documenting our analysis. We've been report writing. We've been um, putting together and negotiating 11 different intergovernmental agreements, um, writing plan amendments for four different plans. And I'm going to go through that. Um, on September 16th, we mailed our public notice to about 4,000 folks in the urban reserves, landowners in the urban reserves, adjacent folks, and interested parties. Um, we're starting to meet with our planning commissions. We have a work session with the Eugene Planning Commission on Tuesday, and then we have a, the Joint Planning Commission public hearing on the 18th. So this is what is included um, in the adoption package. Um, and I think I sent you the planning commission AIS. And so all of these were linked in the attachment B. So it includes a draft ordinance. It's actually a draft Lane County and a separate draft city of Eugene ordinance and amendments in these four plans. And I'm gonna go through some of the key um, new policies that we're recommending in a couple of slides. Um, also, I mentioned in the ordinance are intergovernmental agreements 
um, and they cover coordinated planning between City of Eugene and Lane County and City of Eugene and Lane County and 10 different statutory special districts who have boundaries included in urban reserves. And most of those folks are um, fire districts, but some also include Junction City Water Control District, LTD, and Willamaline has a little bit of property inside our urban reserves. So these IGAs are administrative, meaning they've already been negotiated with each of the service districts and they're ready to be signed by the city council and the board of commissioners when the urban reserves are adopted. So that was a big chunk. Zoli was our IGA whisperer. That was a big chunk of her time for a good part of a year. Um, oh, so these are the folks who we have IGAs with and this is all included in the public record. So the rest of the adoption package includes our legal findings um, that were developed in support of the establishment of the urban reserves. And then the attachments to the findings include a public engagement summary. Our Eugene urban reserves study is basically um, the outline of analysis that we sort of uh, went through uh, the, our process of analysis as laid out by the state um, was turned into the urban reserve study. Um, it documents the analysis of land for inclusion in urban reserves based on those steps required by state statute and rules. And then a subset of the study are our 18 suitability analysis reports. Um, this, it, this is the cover of the Royal Report um, that we shared with you when we went through the suitability analysis for all of our sub areas. Um, the refinement and making sure they were all consistent, since we had 18 of them, we had different authors, making sure the data was all right. Um, updating our mapping repeatedly as small things changed. Um, that was a big part of our work as well. Rebecca, Alexis had his hand up. Okay. You want to ask a question now? Sure. Um, okay. Just going back one slide that you don't have to go back. I was just wondering if the, I can go back. You know, if the, could the intergovernmental agreements uh, impact uh, the district boundaries of any of these organizations? Mainly just out of curiosity, yeah, I don't really have a... So issue. it's about coordinated planning. So it doesn't impact their boundaries now, but what it says is their boundaries are within the urban reserves boundary. So if at some point in the future, that land becomes part of the city limits, then there will be a transition of services. Yeah. Okay. So that's why that's why the state requires coordination because they want to make sure that all of the special districts who now provide services won't necessarily provide services in the future because they're part of urban reserves. And like for instance, LTD might need to extend routes. Oh, except for LTD, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah. Um and Lane County's is different too. Um, yes, LTD, their boundary won't change. We're not taking over LTD's service, but um, but they need to know, it's just good planning for them to know if we're planning on, um, on urbanizing the yeah. area, you know, that's yeah. just, that's just more really related to coordinated planning services. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, the technical memo um, describes a lot of the work that we did with the ETAC, the assumptions and methodology behind the technical analysis and how that work informed the land selected for the urban reserves. So 
a lot of the work that we did with you was formalized in this memo, which is really our methodology, explaining the land need supply, the land need and the land supply and how we did that work. Um, and then included as attachments to that memo is a copy of the land need model, the Excel spreadsheet. Heather made it as beautiful and understandable as possible for us to print out. Um, and then also additional maps that are documenting the undevelopable land uh, in urban reserves. And then the last is a list of tax lots. That's just, a, that's a legal requirement that we include all of the tax lots that are included in urban reserves. So, um, so I just thought I would run through some of the plan amendment policies because this wasn't work that we talked about at all really with the ETAC, um, but it's a key part of of getting urban reserves adopted. Um, first, there are maps. Um, and uh, the reason why we have the same policies in the Metro plan and the Lane County Rural Comprehensive Plan is because here's the Metro plan boundary. It runs through and around um, a lot of the urban reserves area. So you can see um, here, this is just illustrating these lands that are the light orange. Those are the lands that are within the metro plan. The darker orange are outside the metro plan. So we have matching policies in the rural comprehensive plan and the metro plan that constitute all of the plan policies for urban reserves, but what's adopted um, is, is the lighter orange for in the metro plan and the darker orange for in the rural comprehensive plan, because those are the um, those are the documents that regulate those lands. Um, so this just talks about how um, the areas identified on the map shall be given priority consideration consistent with Oregon law for inclusion in the UGB when an expansion is considered. And Thea would like me to point out that the maps aren't just, they aren't adopted as paper maps, they're adopted as GIS shapefiles. So the paper maps are illustrative, but it's the actual GIS maps that are being adopted. Um, and most of our plan policies are really taken directly from the ORS or the OAR, directly taken from the language. Um, they're what's required by the state to include. So, um, but I'll point, but there's two of them that are different or additional, and I'll point that out. So this one focuses on um, the fact that um, that lands will stay rural once they're in urban reserves um, and they'll continue to be able to basically do what they were able to do before. So if you were able to site a single family dwelling on a established unit of land after it has been, before it was included, then you'll still be able to do it after it is included in urban reserves. I'm trying not to read it word for word, but it's difficult. Um, uh, this policy, again, is directly pulled from the OAR. Um, it's talking about continuing to allow planning and zoning of land um, identified uh, for rural uses, but um, it says and, I said but, and in a manner that ensures a range of opportunities for um, for efficient provision of urban services and in a way that doesn't hinder the transition of urban land uses when the lands are brought into the UGB. 
Rebecca, really quick, Lisa, you had mm -hmm. your hand up. I didn't know if you still had a question. Sorry. Oh, oh thanks. I can't see. So thank you. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. I I'm, I know you said, but I just want to double, double, triple check, make sure that <clears throat> on the previous slide, that is written in such a way as to respond to, I think it's House Bill 2001 about single family dwelling, just you know, making sure it's in my head correctly. Is that correct? I don't understand the question, actually. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I believe the city of Eugene is a... Oh, the calling it single family? Yeah, R1 yeah. zoning is no longer allowed. I <clears throat> Would this be just to kind of address that issue? This isn't that issue, actually. This is county land. Uh, so this is since since um, urban reserves is outside of the city that this is looking at those lands um, before they come into the city. So it's basically saying, you folks who live in the county whose land is now going to be also in urban reserves, if you were able to build a house on your land before, you'll still be able to build a house uh, on your land. So it really um, has nothing to do with this new uh, law. It does not. Okay. No. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this policy, again, is taken directly from the OAR, and it's talking about how there are no changes on exception or non-resource land than the use that is currently allowed on that land before it was included in urban re reserves. Um, so this is specific to exception and non-resource land. And then this policy is specific to resource land, so to farm and forest land. And this is the one that isn't this one goes a little bit farther than um, the direction in the OAR um, in that the county is saying resource land that's included in the urban reserves shall not be rezoned or redesignated to a non-resource zone or designation. So um, no conversion of that land to a non-resource zone or designation before, while that land is still urban reserves. Um, except, there is a carve out, um, except for land awarded state or federal investment for the development of rail related infrastructure near existing railways. So that sort of carve out, that exception, um, is based on this Port of Coos Bay mega grant that has been proposed in federal legislation. Um, they're, they have, they're waiting to see if um, they're receiving a, upwards of a billion dollar grant to, um, uh, to invest in the port of Coos Bay um, and the rail line, which goes through Lane County into Eugene. Um, there will be a portion of that project where there will be a need for a transfer facility um, near the rail line and near I-5. Um, the county, we had we had the first part of this policy in and the county in the last few months when they became aware of um, of this grant that's pending this significant um, amount of money that could be flowing into the county um, reworked this policy for. Um, a general except general not site specific but use specific um exception if that grant comes through um 
So that's why it's worded this way. We're waiting to see if that uh, if that money is granted um, and we'll likely know uh, before this project is final. So if they do not get this grant, then um, this policy will likely go back to ending at the end of that underlined section and, and won't have that exception in there. Does anybody have any questions about that while we're on the slide? Oh, Tiffany. No, I said, go ahead, Alexa. Sorry, I can never yeah. mute in time. No worries. I was just curious, if it, is it a IIJA funding? And is it through the Department of Transportation? Um, what does that stand for? Oh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Exact. I I do. I'd have to look it up. If you go to DeFazio's page, hmm. um, the De, uh, Congressman DeFazio's webpage, it has the information on it. It may be. I can't remember the exact. He definitely, um, he definitely has a part, a piece of this. Um, he's, he's definitely a supporter and behind this, but I can't remember if it's part of that act or not. It, okay. Alexis, it might be a member designated um, spending. It, so um, in earmark. Um, yeah. Or, or, but it would have been part of the same infrastructure legislation. package. Yeah. Yeah, Eugene, the city city staff has been not lead on this at all. Um, it's it's been our federal delegation and then the county folks who have been working on it. So I'm not quite as up to speed on on what exactly the details are. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so this, um, no new policy, this is one of the only places where there's um, a state requirement where we are promote, where we are proposing no new policy language um, regarding exception areas and non-resource lands because the county, based on the land that's in urban reserves, uh, the county already complies with its current regulations. Um, for example, um, one of the potential suggestions um, to ensure that um, land divisions on exception areas and non-resource lands don't hinder the efficient transition to urban land uses. One example is not allowing lands that are 10 acres in size to be subdivided um, further. Um, based on the land that's in urban reserves, there's only two parcels um, that could potentially be subdivided under existing uses, but they have a open space easement on them. And so that's in reality not going to happen. So there's a variety of reasons why, um, why the county didn't feel like no new regulatory standards were necessary and that the previous policies um, were sufficient. Here is the last proposed policy and this one is not a state requirement, but um, it was a recommendation or a direction from the board of commissioners when they gave us the, their direction on the urban reserves that they wanted us to um, initiate a review of the urban reserves no later than 10 years after Eugene's first UGB expansion following adoption of urban reserves. So if we, um, whenever we expand our UGB 10 years after that, the, our clock starts ticking and we can decide or we will have to decide what initiating a review of urban reserves actually means. 
I'm hoping it doesn't mean go through this whole process again. I'm hoping it can be a, uh, a more expedited review, um, but it's basically looking at, um, I think it'll be, it will be more expedited because we've done it before and we will have our growth monitoring information and we will have a good sense of um, whether our um, estimates of whether this is a 27 year urban reserve are correct and how fast we're growing. We will have all kinds of new information. So the idea is to, um, to have a, date certain for um, reevaluating urban reserves and the success of that program. So that's it. Those are the highlights of what's in the package. Here's the dates again of our upcoming meetings. Um, these, the ones after the public hearing are tentative. Um, the deliberations meetings are tentative, depending on um, what happens at the public hearing, but um, we have our planning commission meeting next week and the public hearing the following week. So if folks are interested in staying engaged or tuning in, um, mark your calendar. And that's it. Thank you. I, I can see Howard. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go for it, Howard. Yeah, uh, hi, Rebecca. I had a, a question is, uh, on the uh, various uh, provisions in the ordinances uh, where um, land that is still subject to Lane County planning and zoning. Uh, what happens if there's a uh, zoning request uh, to the county uh, that would um, adversely affect uh, potential future land use? Uh, in the urban reserve, if it's you know point in the future that it got brought into the city, uh, in the course of uh, the county's deliberations on that, uh, what role, if any, does the city have other than just providing comments? Do you have veto power, or you know how how would that work? Because what, what I'm concerned about is um, you know down way down the future, um, who knows what's going to happen, but. Uh, you know, if if the county uh, elects to uh, propose, uh, approve a proposal or something that could, you know, adversely affect, uh, you know, the future uh, of Eugene City's, City's plans in the future. So I guess it depends on what the specific proposal is, because some of these plan policies would address that, right? It would it wouldn't allow zone changes from a resource land to non-resource land. So people couldn't um, subdivide their farm into, you know, convert their farm into rural resource land, rural uh rural residential land, excuse me, when it was still in urban reserves. So, so that's a policy that um, doesn't allow that in urban reserves. But I think you're talking more generally about something that would still be allowed in urban reserves, but the city wasn't necessarily the city didn't necessarily agree. Um, we have that coordinated planning agreement with the county that I referred to. It really is similar to um, the referral system that we have right now inside the urban growth boundary. Um, it's just expanded out into urban reserves where we can comment um, but we don't have the ability to um, to directly intervene. So we can work as a partner with the county and provide input. And so it depends really if it gets politicized. It's hard to talk about any specifics without having a specific um, case, but we would definitely um, be aware and have the ability to coordinate with the county. 
Okay, well, that, that answers my question. I, I assumed that the city didn't have veto power, but I just wondered, you know, about the coordination and um, involvement with the city and county before they uh, did something that maybe the city thought, you know, would adversely affect, uh, say, growth or future land use planning in a particular area. So, right, right. Yeah. Um, part of the Part of the policies are trying to basically say, you can do with your land what you can, like while your land is still in urban reserves, you can do what you can do today, but it's sort of frozen. So you can't um, increase the densities. You can't upzone property while it's still in urban reserves because we wanna be able to keep that land rural until and if it is needed to urbanize in the future. So part of it is the coordination piece with the county on the on what's happening in urban reserves and part is um, the policies that will be adopted. Okay, I have Sue and then De and then Dennis. Should I stop sharing? So I have um <laughs> Uh, kind of following along on Howard's tale there, um, I'm curious about this sort of psychological, emotional, um, I don't know, more anecdotal response from the County Planning Commission to this whole project. Um, yeah. How engaged, and, and maybe you can't really say what you might want to say, but I'd be interested to know how engaged they seem with the project, how much knowledge there seems to be, um, just how interested, I, I'm curious, because it is going to involve the county. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly going to involve them, and I just am curious about their level of engagement and interest at this point. Yeah, we so we just met with them on Tuesday, and they have um, quite a new planning commission compared to We've met with them, I think maybe seven times, and um, there were at least four new planning commissioners since the last time we met with them. They actually seem quite engaged, and they were um, they read their materials and they had really good questions. I was very impressed. Um, there is a um, a component of um, I'm concerned that you are um, regulating county residents. There's there's some folks who are concerned about um, this so-called like freeze on what folks can do in the county who um, in the rural areas of the county who are also in urban reserves that. Um, it's just a perspective, you know, it's um, some people, it just depends on what your interests are. Some people see urban reserves as potentially increasing their property value and other people see urban reserves as potentially restricting what they can do on their property. And, and we heard both, just like we have been from the public. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Dennis, then Kevin. Yeah. Um, one, first of all, I just want to say thank you because as the, the new person in the room, um, most of my questions have been answered. Oh, good. I serve as a representative from the Sustainability Commission. Right. And my questions were around the criteria for designation of farmland and forest land, thinking about potential carbon sequestration. Right. Um, and your discussion about soil analysis made that much clearer to me. And I just would like some clarification around a response you gave to Alexis about transportation. There isn't a coordination, as I understand it, with the transit plan, but the transit plan are aware of this process, so they should be doing that from that side. Is that an accurate understanding of how any coordination between reserves and transportation planning might happen? Right, we That's involved, oh, sorry. Um, we involved 
LTD as well as city and county transportation planning divisions and ODOT um, in our service provider meetings um, to hear from them at a really high level how um, suitable they thought these different areas would be for future urbanization. So LTD gave us input on potentially expanding their services to different areas and how easy or difficult or costly that could be in the future. And so they helped us with our suitability analysis um, at a very high level and um, so that was that piece. And the IGAs are sort of a related but separate piece saying, as we um, potentially expand into these areas, we'll coordinate with you so that you know what our plans are. So that can help inform your plans. Thank you. Yeah. Good answer, Rebecca. <laughs> I thought you. I was going to have to answer LTD <laughs> representative here. <laughs> you can fill in. <laughs> no, you're <laughs> thankfully we're all talking to each other. That that's helpful, right? Right. right. Um, Kevin, go ahead. So I just wanted to ask as you go into these uh, planning commission meetings, the deliberations, and then the and then the deliberations, the workshops. Do you do you want any help from ETAC members in um, participating in these meetings, um, or are you? Do you see this as on a smooth glide path um, to implementation? Um, well, I would never ever say that. Um, I, I actually have. I haven't come with a real ask. Um, I feel like the ETAC formally uh did its work getting us to this point so i don't think that there's a formal role for the etac but um i welcome and encourage any um individual participation and input or testimony that folks would like to give regarding the soundness of the technical analysis or um, you know the related work that um, or really as a private citizen whatever you would like to speak on um, but I think the time I think we got a sort of formal letter from the ETAC for direction. And I'm reminding people of that. And I'm reminding people of your role and that we met with you 18 times um, to review our technical input. So I will let you know that I am name dropping the ETAC right and left. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, because I think that your work was critical in, um, in getting us to a, a good proposal. I'll, so I'll, I'll try, oh, sorry, to someone No, else. so I just hope you're comfortable with that name dropping, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to chime in and just kind of make an observation. I think, um, and, and maybe there's a bit of a question here, but you know, I think that when with with planning commissions that are, you know, having to make decisions, I think that the the hesitation seems to be where you have pushback from community that maybe was, you know, didn't feel that they were informed or, or hadn't been engaged or whatever else, because we're kind of starting to see that. And it's it's been hard with with the pandemic and with the way that we've had to engage while in one sense, it makes uh, everybody a little bit more accessible, but, I, you know, it's still, it's still a challenge for a lot of people. And um, I think that typically when folks receive something in their mailbox that says, hey, come learn about something, they don't necessarily connect those dots that this is actually potentially going to impact your actual piece of property, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that the 
um, the questions that may come from the commission, we'll be looking to find out, like really diving in to what was the public engagement. And of course, there will be public hearings. And so I think that's where um, there may be asks to be a little bit more deliberate with uh, outreach and just be uh, making sure that folks who may be impacted actually really do understand and are asked to weigh in in a meeting meaningful way. And I'm just, we're just kind of starting to see that. And there's been lots of public processes that um, have been going on for years. And mm -hmm. it's, it's very common that it's the, you know, the, as soon as the bulldozers at the back door, people suddenly were like, wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't realize that mailer was meant for me. And, and, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's hard, but, but I think that that's what I would anticipate being where any kind of hesitation um, or really wanting to dive deep in is like, well, what, what have we heard from people? What, what are they saying? Where's, you know, where's, where's controversy if there is any or things like that. So kind of understanding, I don't even remember who said this uh, already, but, you know, folks that, uh, well, I, it was, I think it was Rebecca, where you said that the, um, there's people inside in the city or people in the county that are seeing that potentially could be either a potential to increase their property value or increase restrictions on their property. And so depending on how they see it, if they even know, um, you know, what, what potential impacts are. So I think that's the, the place where public entities are starting to feel like they're falling short a bit where, you know, it's just like, there's never enough public input, but you got to make decisions at a certain point. So, um, right. And it's hard for a project, um, that has gone on as long as this one has, because I heard from someone today who just moved here four months ago. So she hadn't heard about this project, but it was impacting her. Um, so it's, it's a long project. And even though we feel like we've repeatedly reached out to our rural county constituents who are being directly impacted by this, things change, people move and um, people, you know, focus and not and and it's been a long time. And so, um, yeah, yeah, it is a challenge. And we are so far just anecdotally, we, we're, we're hearing a variety of input from folks. We're hearing um, folks who wanna be in, who aren't in, and folks who are in, who don't wanna be in. So we're not as much hearing yay <laughs> from anybody because that's not who sends you the email ahead of the public hearing are the people who are happy with you. <laughs> it's the people who um, who have issues. So we haven't, we don't have an overwhelming number at all, but um, yeah, it's, it's um, people sort of fall along the entire spectrum, I would say. And Rebecca, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, even if someone is brought into a, you know, a, U, a, a UGB, we don't, we, we haven't had a practice of, of, of forced annexation, right? That's so if there's correct. a property yeah. owner, just because they are, they happen to be within the UGB, we have that all over, um, doesn't mean that they're necessarily, you know, forced into annexing. They are not forced. We yeah. have a policy of of only having voluntary annexations. Right. That's right. And I haven't heard any talk of changing that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's going to be an important thing to reiterate. Definitely. For people that, especially if they just moved here, they wouldn't know that, right? Yes, <laughs> definitely. We have a long, long list of FAQs. We have to figure out how to really highlight the ones that people care about most. Um, speaking of which, Thea or Zoli or Heather, I think we're running out of time, but do you guys have anything that you want to add? 
look, Heather's taking a drink. She's like, no, I'm not talking. <laughs> it's not my agenda item. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make sure. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions on that agenda item, I, I think if we're ready to move on, we're, we're kind of back on schedule now. Um, and Heather, growth monitoring timeline overview. You, oh, wait, Lisa has a question. I see you now. Okay, go for it, Lisa. <laughs> so sorry to interrupt. I just have to announce that, unfortunately, I have conflicting events and I have to go. <laughs> My apologies. Okay, thank you. Okay. But thank Thanks, you for Lisa. this presentation. That was really great. Thank you. Okay. That is the nice thing about Zoom um, is that Lisa can watch it later. So, <laughs> um, okay. So at the last meeting, um, we touched a little bit on that the state has adopted these new rules called climate friendly and equitable communities. And we are still digging into them and what they mean. Some of you may have. Um, watched the council overview. We gave council an overview on September 12th, I think it was, of the different components of the rules. Um, and then we went last week to them about um, implementation of the parking rule changes. So there's multiple different components, and I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, but what came up last time was um, there, there are a lot, <laughs> and um, how how does that play into growth monitoring and urban reserves and um, UGB analysis? Our next look at our UGB that we'll need to do. So I just wanted to mostly let you guys know we are thinking about that right now and trying to do some timelining about all of these different related projects that are going on, but also give you a bit of a visual um, on um, how it looks right now based on state mandated deadlines. Um, certainly the CFEC, Climate Friendly Equitable Communities, affectionately known as CFEC, um, that there are some deadlines in those different components that are in the, the new rules that can be adjusted um, if you request it and there's some criteria, but not all of the components can be adjusted, the deadlines. So I'm just, what I'm gonna be showing you is based on what's in the rules right now um, because we haven't applied for any sort of deadline adjustment. So just know that. Um, this is super high level, pretty drafty, but I know, you know, as CFEX starts to be talked about in the community and at council, I want you all to be um, as informed as we are about how things relate. I'm going to share my screen, maybe. Okay. Oops. See you all. Um, okay, so just as a reminder, can you guys see my cursor as I'm moving it around? Okay. So just as a reminder, you've seen this before. So we're right now in our growth monitoring cycle. We've reported some results. Um, you know, we collected the data, um, we reported the results, the report compared the assumptions to that that we've made in our UGB the last time we adopted the UGB and um, which was a 2012 to 2032 urban growth boundary. Um, we had our awesome 300 plus page report to council comparing those assumptions to actual results. And so, you know, since we did this graphic, and I just 
try to remind us about this is that, um, you know, we thought that the report would tell us um, if we need to initiate a UGB um, review. So are we growing faster than we thought we were? Um, are our strategies like, um, you know, the multiple unit property tax exemption program, is it producing the amount of um, dwellings downtown that we uh, adopted as part of our urban growth boundary, that assumption, or do we need to adjust that program? Just as an example, we have other um, efficiency measure strategies that we adopted as part of the urban growth boundary. So all of that was wrapped up in our comprehensive report. Um, but so we thought the report would tell us, right, if we need to adjust those things and get on it right now. Well, as we know, um, you know, it was more complicated than that. And um, since then, the state has also given us that deadline, which is that we have to adopt our housing, a new housing capacity analysis. So it's the housing portion of this next UGB analysis has to be adopted by December of 2026. So um, like, I, like I was saying, you know, when we first put growth monitoring together, we thought the report would tell us we need to look at our UGB again or tell us to look at efficiency strategies again. Um, that information is still there, but we actually already have a deadline that is not very far away. It's actually three months and three years away. <laughs> not that I'm counting. Um, and so... So this is still relevant in the fact that the next time we do our UGB analysis, um, you do a housing capacity analysis, you figure out what your demand is for the next 20 years, and you look at, you rerun your buildable lands inventory, and you compare the two and see if you have enough land still inside your urban growth boundary for the next 20 years of demand. So we did a little bit of that in the growth monitoring report. And if you don't then, if you don't have enough land, then you look at um, housing efficiency measures. So to strategies to grow more compactly. And if you still don't have enough land, once urban, res oops, sorry. That. Once urban reserves is adopted, we can look at, um, some portion, that's what this little pie is, is saying not all of urban reserves, right? But what portion of urban reserves would you potentially look at expanding the urban growth boundary into? Um, and then, you know, your, your UGB gets adjusted. So you've seen this, this timeline, generic timeline was in the growth monitoring report. Um, so we've done the, we did the first growth monitoring report. We, um, there wasn't really council direction because again, we've already got, we've got a deadline now that we didn't have um, before to do, to analyze the UGB for, um, at least for housing. Um, and then where we are right now, um, we are here, we're in the urban reserves, we're just starting the urban reserves adoption process, so that is amazing, and while that's going on, we're still doing growth monitoring. Um, so then, while we're collecting data and doing growth monitoring and doing our annual reports, um, some point soon, we're gonna need to start that next UGB analysis review, specifically for housing. Um, and I say that because that's what the deadline is for. Um, I'm still not sure how you would not look at all of your, your land needs. Um, <laughs> it feels like it would be difficult to just look at your housing needs. Um, so at this point, I'm assuming we're going to look at the all of our needs, commercial, industrial, parks and open space, schools, and housing. Um, but the deadline we have is for a new housing needs or housing capacity, as it's been renamed, um, study to be adopted by December of 2026. Um, we also think that that means 
doing efficiency measures and identifying if any UGB expansion is needed. But that is, I need to get further clarification on that, but that is the assumption. And so you can see right here that we've got housing efficiency measures. I've got employment here because again, we're assuming we're gonna do it all at once. So with climate friendly and equitable communities, now that that is a real thing, um, it has real deadlines. And so um, this is from the presentation we gave to both planning commission and city council. It's just the key components. And again, these are the deadlines that are in the rules right now. Um, some of them are adjustable, um, some of them are not. And so um, there are new parking regulations that we have to comply with. So we'll have to change um, our parking, how much parking is required um, in the city of Eugene. And there are um, requirements around parking lots and the, the minimum and the maximum amount of parking. And this is off street um, parking. Um, so right now that is due June of 2023. That doesn't necessarily impact growth monitoring, um, but I just, it is, that is the most recent conversation that's going to be happening. Um, council directed us to ask for an extension to this deadline um, so that we could do, actually do public involvement because any sort of code amendment to our zoning code um, typically takes about six months. And so <laughs> we really don't um, have enough time, you know, it'll be really tight um, if we if we didn't get an extension from the state. Um, the next thing that's up is climate friendly areas. And so we have to study um, and submit a study by the end of next year. Um, identifying where potential climate friendly areas are and the rules define what a climate friendly area is but in short um, those are essentially areas that have higher densities so think downtown areas that are have higher densities would be walkable or are planned to be walkable multimodal um, walkable uh, bikeable you know, has um, has or is planned to have infrastructure to support that kind of compact development and reduce reliance on um, on motor vehicles. Transit. How did I not say transit? So, um, so certainly downtown is one of those. The rules were written with the thought that you would focus on downtown. There may be other areas or. Um, ed areas along the edges of, of downtown that would be appropriate as a climate friendly area. That's what the study is all about. Um, so you're looking at densities, you're looking at um, whether or not the areas are zoned to accommodate that kind of housing and jobs. And also um, you're doing some um, public outreach and an equity analysis because um, the rules are not just about compact development at no cost. It's about compact development to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while at the same time um, identifying if there are um, issues to underrepresented populations in your community um, with designating it a climate friendly area. And if there are, what are the mitigation strategies like addressing potential displacement, things like that. Um, so that study is gonna be going on for the next year. And then we actually have to adopt those climate friendly areas by December of 2024. And so, you know, there's, there's some other things. We have to do some scenario planning, which we've actually already done. Um, that we did it in 2015, um, which is, you know, how can the region grow in a way that reduces greenhouse gas emissions? So we've already done some of that modeling. And then we have to update our TSP to reflect, you know, these climate friendly areas and these and this a scenario plan that would reduce greenhouse um, gas emissions in the area. But the important thing I think here is that one, 
um, once we identify and adopt those climate friendly areas, we will have to monitor um, the amount of housing that goes in these areas um, because there's a threshold that we have to meet in the state statutes. So that's important to know that you are going to have to we're going to see this um, and we, you know, that it's a little bit down the road, but, um, you know, we're, we have to start thinking about making sure that um, our systems can handle um, reporting by a specific boundary like that, rather than, you know, housing in, inside the whole UGB. This will be discrete areas. Um, and then because climate friendly areas have to be zoned, they have to have enough theoretical capacity in the zoning to accommodate 30% of our housing needs, um, that will also get wrapped into um, when we do our UGB analysis in the future. So this is not very pretty and I apologize. It's got lots of colors on it. I, had, I did this really quick. Um, so sorry about that, but basically I just wanted you to see, um, you know, like I said, growth monitoring is still happening right now. We're working, we're still working on incorporating the recent middle housing code amendments into our growth monitoring system. So revising those charts, that sort of thing, um, is more complicated than, um, it, it than one would have anticipated, um, not just the charts, but the systems themselves, because as we talked about last time, housing types got renamed, and so we have to change all of that. Um, we're still working on the community dashboard, um, so getting key data up on the community dashboard that we talked about last time, but that, because middle housing has taken a while, um, that's going to bleed over into 2023. Elena has started reviewing um, building permits that were issued um, after we started writing the growth monitoring report. So data that isn't in our last growth monitoring report. And then I think the first part of 2023 will be, you know, developing the draft annual report and reviewing the data. So that's all still pretty much the same as we talked about last time. And then with CFEC, the parking rules right now, like I said, are um, due to be adopted by mid-2023. Um, and then we've got our climate-friendly area study and adoption, the land use and transportation scenario planning, um, and then adoption is over here. And meanwhile, <laughs> Um, soon, we need to start UGB analysis. Actually, when I drew this, see, I did draw this too fix. Um, I'm not really sure when we're going to start this, but um, the work that we've done with growth monitoring with Thea, working on the BLI and getting that in a good place, um, it's going to be easier to do some of those initial steps on the UGB analysis than it would have been if we hadn't done growth monitoring. So that's a good thing. But basically, you know, I think 2023, 2024, and 2025 are going to be about um, the UGB analysis and efficiency measures um, because we are pretty sure that we'll have we won't meet our 20-year needs with our current um, projections. I, that's at least what the growth monitoring report showed. So any um, any questions on that? You no, know, it's a lot to look at and we can definitely come back and talk about things, but I mostly just wanted to let you know you're going to start hearing about climate friendly um, and we're going to have to start the next UGB analysis process pretty soon. Mark, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm wondering to what extent these state mandated requirements for density in the climate friendly areas uh, increase density relative to the assumptions that have gone into the planning thus far and thus affect the, you know, well, will affect the, the overall demand for developable lands. 
Yeah, I mean, those that will be part of the study. So we will have to look, um, we will be, it's kind of an iterative process where you're I initially identifying candidate climate friendly areas. Um, so again, downtown as one obvious example. Um, we don't have a minimum or a maximum density in downtown and the way that the climate friendly area analysis is done is you're not really looking at minimum and maximum density. You're actually just figuring out, or sorry, you're not looking at what you on average get there. You're looking at what the zoning would allow at kind of at max build out and then assuming um, that only a certain part of that building would be residential. It's pretty complicated. So, um, so anyway, that will all be part of the climate friendly area study is looking at the density and figuring out if you need to amend your zoning code um, to have enough capacity for the density outcomes that, that the rules um, want you to achieve. But, but, but do you, I mean, just off the top of your head, is it your impression that, I mean, that, the, that the expected densities in the climate friendly areas are gonna be higher than what has been the assumption thus far? It really depends on what climate friendly area is picked, right? Yeah, because yep, because our assumptions so far have are based on the plan designation of property. And until we know what the climate friendly areas are that we're looking at, we can't do that comparison. Um, but generally I would say that they are on the higher end you know, of high density, there is an option for more of a medium density type climate friendly area, um, but that's also on the higher end of medium density, so. Kevin? You mentioned, Heather, a 30%, is that part of the state requirement yeah. that 30% of our housing be climate friendly? Yep. And it's, Ex, uh, existing plus projected. Heather, I have a question. Um, I don't know. So, you know, this process, obviously this is a state mandate. Um, we're asking for public input, which is always tricky when there's only so much they really have to, to weigh in. Um, I'm curious as to what, if there are criteria that have been established by, um, you know, the rule that says that the climate friendly areas must be, you know, such and such. I only reason I ask is because I am just envisioning that that is going to become the community battle is whose whose area of town becomes the next. Some of them will be obvious, others maybe not so much. And so you've got, you know, differences of opinion as to who wants to be forced to densify and who doesn't or whatnot. I'm just curious if there are criteria that are built in or that the study would be informing for us to then say, you know, for the city to then say, these are the climate friendly areas. And that's, that's yep. the way it is. Yeah, yeah, there is criteria. I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, I mean, I think the guide that DLCD put out for doing the climate friendly area study is like 60 pages. So, um, <laughs> so it's, you know, it, there's a lot to it. Um, and there's criteria for public engagement as well. And for doing an equity analysis, um, all there's lots of prescriptive criteria. So we're still figuring that out. Um, I mean, we're grateful that DLCD um, did put out a guide. And so we're, we're looking at that. That just got published, I think, earlier this week. Okay. Any other questions that I can't answer? I, I think I might have one more. Um, I know that there are what nine municipalities or that are challenging this in court. So I'm curious. And there's also gubernatorial election that could impact the 
you know, the, the change to these rules. I'm just kind of curious if, if there's any, you know, if this, there, some of it's got really tight timelines and I'm just kind of curious if there's any element of timeline as to when that might, the certainty of knowing we are pushing forward and we have, you know, these, these marching orders and we're going to be doing all this versus, well, we got to maybe wait and see because if there's a, a, a challenge that's successful or a, a change in leadership that would um, change the course of direction of, of that. I just was kind of curious if there had been conversations at all about how we would handle that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there probably has been, but not that I am privy to. Um, I think that, you know, the, I think there is a legal question about if it gets appealed, um, or it is getting appealed, um, what, what that does, but, um, I, you know, I think that there's, I want to say, and maybe Alexis, you know, but I want to say that there isn't the same kind of deadline maybe for submitting an appeal or um, it's been unclear to me right. if there is a deadline for submitting an appeal. But I, I want to say that like if it's a uh, revision to an administrative rule, it doesn't have the same type of procedure that we're used to with like a land use application or us amending our own code, you have to submit at a certain time. And I'm not sure that that's the same for an OAR revision. It, I, all I know is that it doesn't go to LUBA. It goes to the Court right. of Appeals. And uh, there is a different timeline. I'm not, I'm actually doing research to figure that out right now. Um, oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. So TDD, I mean, at this point, like I said, we got council direction on parking um, to request an extension for the specific reason of doing um, outreach. And um, yeah, we definitely heard loud and clear that we need to be really clear about where there are options for the public to weigh in on because, like I said, a lot of it is very prescriptive and um, and there isn't a lot of wiggle room. So. Yeah, appreciate that. Well, thank you. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Um, hold on here. Got multiple screens. Well, we can move on to next steps. Is there? Do we fall? Do we already do that? Or yeah. Oh, yeah. we did it already. Okay. Uh, well, with that, I think I'm going to Kevin. Do you want to take a few minutes and? I hate to put you on the spot, but our um, well speaking of, speaking of density, um, <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about it, and uh, the last couple of years, and have decided to uh, live it instead of just talking about it. And I'm I'm buying a condominium in downtown Portland, um, right on the river. Um, should close the end of this month and um, gonna be able to walk right to the max and the trolley and PSU and all the stuff downtown and of course Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens and the whole peninsula and the Columbia River and all that wonderful open space. So I will, um, you know, I've offered to, since we're meeting remotely, I'm happy to continue to provide some continuity, but I think as you look for new members, as I think Heather and Rebecca, you said you were going to be doing this winter, um, I should phase out because it would be awkward for me to be providing advice from up there to Eugene. So I thoroughly enjoyed working on this and uh, nothing but the most regard, the highest regard for all the staff and the work that you guys have done. And that the input that you got from ETAC members, particularly those that graduated from previous iterations like Sue and John, who's not here and um, who else is some of the long, real long timers, but um, it's been great working with you all. 
Well, Kevin, I just, I feel like it's, uh, we'll, we will absolutely miss you and your wisdom. And obviously you've been with doing this work for a long time and clearly it's inspired you. So um, I think that's, <laughs> I think that's a testament to, um, you know, the, the, um, the livability that we are kind of working on here in this, in this group. And so I definitely appreciate all of the, you know, the work that you've done and stepping in uh, to run the meetings and whatnot. So, um, and I really hope that you keep us posted on how, how life in the big city, I call it the big city, you know, uh, is going because. Yeah, well, I, and I didn't know until very recently that there's a um, ballot initiative to completely reform the city of Portland government, go to a city manager, uh, double the number of city council members, you know, change how departments are run. Um, so it, if it passes, it could be a very exciting time to be there. Wow. So you guys should all I keep had no idea. So radar tuned to that. Yeah. Yeah. That well, wasn't just... how how primitive or not primitive, I think it's the wrong word, but um, I didn't know how Portland was governed and, and just how unsuitable it is for a city that size in the 21st century. Yeah, Sue, you, ha you have your hand up, go, go ahead. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm so sad that Kevin is leaving Eugene because I know what he's done for the last several years since he moved here and it's been significant. Um, probably more than more than a lot of people I know who've lived here for a very long time. I'm jealous. I'm sort of <laughs> because I love big cities too. And I'm aware of what's going on in Portland I know right now with their um, vote for changing their governing model. And I think it's incredibly exciting. There's a tremendous opportunity for Portland to uh, kind of right the wrongs from the last several years. And you're going to be right there. And I'll bet you'll be right in the thick of it. So you have to keep us posted because it's actually very exciting. Uh, Alexis, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I got to jump on this train. First of all, to thank Kevin and the incredible work he's been doing with us over the last four some years. Uh, but also separate from that commission, uh, the, the charter revisions, they're also separating their planning and sustainability commission. That's one commission right now. And there'll be new seats for you in Ooh. local government when you get to Portland. I like that idea. <laughs> Heather, you have your hand up. Oh yeah, so I'm gonna jump on that train or bus <laughs> or multimodal uh, way. Skateboard. <laughs> um, and yeah, if you need a reference for a board, I think we would all sign and we are so grateful. And, um, you know, I hope this isn't your last ETAC meeting, but I will say that we're probably going to cancel the um, October 20th, I think it is meeting. And so, um, you know, and then, yeah, we, you know, I, do, I don't know if we'll come back when you're still on it. So I can't miss this opportunity to thank you immensely. Um, for your time and your thoughts and your comments and um, representing the ETAC um, at Council um, and Planning Commission. So thank you for that. Um, and just best of luck. Um, it's very exciting. Well, it's been a real honor to work with all of you. So thank you. All right. Well, on that note, a sad note, um, if anybody, unless anybody else has anything else to add, I can let us go a little early, but Kevin, please keep us in the loop. Let us know how it's going for you. I'll have a great um, guest room that has a balcony that looks right out Ooh. at the Willamette River, a marina there. Um, I've got shops and restaurants the 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 little river cafe is oh yeah right below my unit that's so our favorite you know place it. to stay in portland is just that right there on the south waterfront area we always whenever we're visiting we always stay there so yeah, yeah i have to come find you right up at the end. <laughs>
All, All right, right, everybody. We'll see you soon. Let us know when our next meeting is going to be, and we'll we'll be there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Great seeing you. Congratulations, Kevin. We'll miss you. Bye, guys. Bye.